Hey everybody, welcome to Pop Culture Philosophers. I'm Rockin' Robbie Billups, and it's time for my top 10 comic books of the week. That's right, everybody. Thanks for checking out the video. I am Rockin' Robbie Billups. Today, I'm going to be revealing my top 10 favorite comic books for new comic book day this week, because there's like kind of like two new comic book days or whatever. It's been a while since we've done one of these videos, but I'm very excited to be bringing it back. These are the 10 books that I want to highlight my personal favorites, and I want to hear your favorites down in the comments. Without further ado, let's get right into it. At number 10, we have Batman. The Adventures Continue, number one, written by Alan Burnett and Paul Dini, with artwork by Ty Templeton. Batman The Adventures Continue is slam bang fun. If you are a big fan of the animated series, you're gonna love this one. It's got artwork by Ty Templeton. He used to do a lot of these Batman Adventures books. He really perfectly captures that Bruce Timm style. And of course you got original animated series writers Paul Dini and Alan Burnett crafting a story that picks up right where the last episode of Batman the Animated Series and the Superman the Animated Series left off. Continuing that world, building it up, had a lot of fun with this one. You got Lex Luthor, you got giant robots, you got Superman, and like I said, you got something that really just continues that story from the animated series Really great stuff in this series, which was digital first, so if you can't wait, you can go ahead and get them Comixology or whatnot and find the rest of them. But it builds and it introduces characters into the animated Bat-verse that we've never seen before. Upcoming, we'll have Deathstroke. We'll even have a little bit of Jason Todd action. That's right, this book's kind of catching up a lot of steam. People really digging it and responding very well to it. Batman the, Anadva uh, blah, Batman, the Adventures continue. My number 10 book of the week. At number 9, we've got Join the Future, number 2, written by Zach Kaplan, with artwork by Pieter Kowalski, Brad Simpson on the coloring, Hassan Otsman El Howe on the lettering. Join the Future is a sci-fi western from Aftershock comic books. I was blown away by issue number 1, and it had a great gut punch at the end. This continues right from there, with that same momentum, with the same thematic material. It's about a woman who's losing everything. Uh, losing everything to a progressive society. It seems like everything's nice in this futuristic city. Everything's like health care's free, food's provided for, everybody gets to live a life of leisure, if that's what you want to do. Meanwhile, you got these holdouts, these people that still kind of live to a more primitive style of life, at least from those in the city, and they're trying to convince everybody to join them, right? And they want to reformat the earth back to a wild place, but the city is where everything is. Giant mega city where everybody's dreams come true, right? But there's something underneath there that's not so cool. Her entire village pretty much gets wiped out. Now, it's not just a sci-fi western. It's a sci-fi revenge western. It was absolutely fantastic. Zach Kaplan knows how to write this script. He knows how to make the pace brisk, but still meaty all at the same time. Um, Kowalski's artwork, especially with Brad Simpson's coloring, which is absolutely perfect for the primitive setting versus the futuristic city setting. Great stuff. Hassan Otsman El Howe, one of the best letterers in the business. This was a fantastic book. A great issue number two. Landed at number nine. At number eight, Something is Killing the Children, number seven. Written by James Tiny and the Fourth, with artwork by Werther Del Editera and Miguel Muerto on the coloring. Boom Studios is just really making the case that they're one of the absolute best publishers in the comic book industry right now, if not the best. And Something is Killing the Children is pretty much at the top of that list for me as far as fantastic boom books go. And that's a very privileged list to be on. Highly esteemed. We got Once in Future, we got Folklores, we got Red Mother, we got Strange Skies over East Berlin. But to me, Something is Killing the Children rises above because it sets a tone. It sets such a melancholy tone and it feels to me like my favorite parts of Twin Peaks at times. Like when you're watching Twin Peaks season one especially, and you're dealing with the real brutal, raw, and visceral emotion from the townspeople after the death of Laura Palmer, I feel that, especially in this issue, issue number seven, the second story, or the second part, I should say, in the second story, The House of Slaughter. You're also learning more about the character of Erica. It is Erica, right? Hopefully it is. If not, <laughs> correct me. Um, but you're learning more about 
her past, the organization that she's aligned with, what's going on. It's building the world out even further. This book hits hard emotionally. It's brutal. It doesn't hold back any punches. And I love it for that. The artwork, the layouts and composition by Della Editera and Muerto, the coloring, everything fits this atmospheric tone that is perfect. And like I said, this reminds me of some of my favorite emotional and tonally resonant bits from Twin Peaks Season 1. That is the highest praise I can give this book. Something's Killing the Children, number 7, comes in at number 8. At number 7, Batman, number 92. Also written by James Tiny in the fourth, with artwork by Gilliam March and Tamo Moray. I really did like this book. I know that it's had a lot of hype. The hype has even been extended because of the Diamond Shutdown. We've been waiting 11 weeks for this book. The first full-fledged cover and story appearance by Punchline, the new Joker henchman who has got everybody kind of twisted up, waiting for it, right? you got that art germ cover on the variant. You've got a lot of interesting um, stuff going on. You want to know more about this character. We've been building up to this moment. It did not disappoint. James Tiny in the fourth is doing a really solid Batman story. And at first you're like, this is decent. We're getting into it. But with the addition of Punchline and the hype that's being built up, leading up into the Joker War. This absolutely worked. Seriously. March, Tiny, and Amori, they absolutely had to nail this book. It was really going to turn a lot of us off. They nailed this book. Punchline's first full-on story appearance had impact. Her personality shone through. I'm really liking it. I'm not minding it at all. I'm not usually the biggest fan of March's uh, line work, but I really did like it in this one. You got some really fun Riddler and Batman bits going on. But of course, Punchline is the star of this issue, and it did not disappoint. It makes the top 10. At number six, we have Undone by Blood, or The Shadow of a Wanted Man. Number three from Aftershock Comics, written by Lonnie Nadler and Zach Thompson, with artwork by Sammy Cavella, Jason Wordy on the coloring, Hassan Onsman El Hal on the lettering. Undone by Blood is a more modern day, yet still classic revenge western, and I'm absolutely falling in love with it. It's given me tones and vibes of No Country for Old Men, the Coen Brothers True Grit remake. It almost has some vibes from the Coen Brothers. It's not quite as quirkily and absurdly funny at times, but I do like this book. You got two stories going on at the same time. You got one set in the 1970s. It's about this, it's about this young woman. She is like the lone survivor of this attack on her family, and she's out for revenge. So even though it's kind of modernized, it's set in the 70s, it still has this classic feel. That's accentuated by the idea that she's reading a classic Western tale called The Shadow of a Wanted Man. And the book flips between these two stories, but they very much relate to one another thematically. Um, the parallel between the story, it's really great. It's akin to something like The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, um, in The Watchmen, it's kind of like that. Maybe not quite as sophisticated because there's not quite so much going on around it. It's very much in your face with its thematic um, relatability between the two stories, but it's spot on. It's great. The artwork, first of all, Sammy Cavella, I love this cat's artwork ever since I first really saw it and noticed it in Abbott. Loved that book. This book's even better. You got Jason Wordy on the coloring, providing a grit, a savage grit, a savage grit to this book that really makes it very effective as a grimy, sweaty, re revenge western. And I absolutely love it. Great characters, great bits, great sense of pacing and flow. This book is stupendous. And you got Hassan Altman El Hal. The lettering is so effective in this book. It really becomes part of the artwork and it is a star in and of itself. Love this book and some of the most excellent composition you'll see in comic books this week on Done by Blood. Now we get to the top five. Number five, The Joker, 80th anniversary, 100 page super spectacular. So a lot of these DC anniversary books that are like super size, they're like $10, they got a bunch of stories from a bunch of great creators and stuff like that. Yeah, they've been pretty interesting. They're nice, they're nice celebrations of the character and its legacy. The Joker blows them all the way. You've got an amazing story in here by Scott Snyder and Jock that to me just takes the cake. That book is, that story is so creepy, so menacing, so 
effective. It's just absolutely great and bonkers balls to the wall. You got work by Brian Azzarello. You got work by Paul Dini. You got work by Denny O'Neill. You got a plethora of amazing artists on this book. And then you, of course, got the punchline origin. So if you're really enticed by the character punchline, want to know exactly kind of where she comes from and what it is, you're going to find it out in this book with the punchline origin that is written by James Tiny and the Fourth. So James basically makes three appearances with all three of his books here on the top 10. So I think he gets writer of the week, but there's some great books to get to come. But the Joker anniversary special is great. Each story was something unique and something different and something very much um, perfect for a certain era of the Joker and a certain style of writing the Joker. I absolutely loved it. I had fun with it. It's got some great covers. I think out of all these DC celebrations, these super spectaculars, this is by far the best one. At number four, we've got Daredevil, number 20, from Marvel Comics, written by Chip Zdarsky, with artwork by Marco Cicchetto, coloring by Mattia Icono. Yo, Chip Zdarsky's been just tearing it up on Daredevil, and Cicchetto has as well. This book is fa fantastic. For 20 issues, we've been building up to this moment. This moment where all hell breaks loose in Hell's Kitchen. You've got the Kingpin and the Owl. You've got the police department. You've got Daredevil. You've got Stiltman in a very threatening and non-humorous appearance. you got Rhino. you got so many villains, so much chaos going on in the street of Hell's Kitchen. And everything's been building up to this moment. But it's not an ending. It's not a finale. It's a brilliant setup for the next phase, the next next act of Chip Zdarsky's run in Matt Murdock's life. Marco Cicchetto's artwork, the coloring by Ayakono, is brilliant and beautiful. It captures that chaotic energy that's necessary, but it still glistens and gleams in very effective, powerful, heroic moments. It captures the, the, the powers of Daredevil, the, the acrobatic skill of Daredevil, the radar sense, and just the chaos of everything going on, and such a great Matt Murdock moment. If you are a fan of the classic Daredevil runs, this is a privilege to be reading one as it's happening, Sadarsky's run is going to go down as part of Daredevil's legacy. I'm calling it right now, 20 issues in, it's a damn classic run, makes the top five. At number three, Decorum, number two from Image Comics, written by Jonathan Hickman, with artwork by Mike Huddleston. Yo, Decorum is exactly what you expect from Jonathan Hickman, an imaginative, incredibly imaginative story, intensive world building, lots of detail put in for what actually on the surface is kind of a simple story. It's what if Emma Peel, not Emma Peel, what's her name? What if there was a prim and proper elite aristocratic assassin in a crazy bonkers sci-fi world? Right, And in typical Hickman fashion, you've got charts, you've got graphs, you've got maps, you've got things that are being built up, information just being shoved down your throat. You've got beautiful artwork by Mike Huddleston. Huddleston is doing a different style for each scene, and it all stands out, but it all feels cohesive all at the same time. Not a very easy task to achieve. Decorum, even though... It seems a little unclear. It's kind of an easy story, but the world building is so intricate, it adds so much. It fleshes out what could just be a simple story into something majestic, into something magnificent, into something so meticulously, monumentally m awesome. I couldn't come up with another M word, but I love it. Decorum, two issues in, I'm loving it. Eight issues to, uh, in the entire run. I'm very excited. This is definitely going to be something that as we get closer to the end, a lot more is going to start becoming clear. But it's what if there was an assassin with impeccable decorum in a crazy Hickman universe? That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what I expect. And it delivered 100%. At number two, Mountainhead number four from IDW Publishing. Written by John Lees with artwork by Ryan Lee. Coloring by Doug Garbart. Sean Lee on the lettering. Yo, issue four of Mountainhead was by far the best one yet, and this book has already been badass and awesome. I loved this. It takes such a strange, absurd, in-your-face, and explosive turn in issue number four. It blew me away. This is a story about a kid who was... So this kid was stolen from his true parents, right? And he's... He's led in this life of crime by his fake dad, but all he knows is his real dad. They eventually find him, arrest his father, or who he thinks is his father, and he gets sent to this northern town 
um, where there's this big mountain and there's some kind of mountain madness going on. And now he's got to get used to his actual family and he's not really responding well. And you get all of that and it's great. But you have this subtle thing going on with this madness that's creeping from this mountain and these visions that these kids are having. And then in issue number four, which is the penultimate issue, it explodes into such a absurd theater of Lovecraftian madness that I just was, I had so much fun. It was such a roller coaster ride. I loved it. The artwork by Ryan Lee, it's very stylized and cartoonish at times, very angular, but it works so well. It's got grit and detail to it, even though it does at times feel caricature-esque in a way, almost like it belongs in a mad magazine, but it fits the the intense mad energy of this book. Garbark and Lee, they round out that team. If you have not been reading Mountainhead, you definitely should. If you can't get caught up, get the trade when it comes out. This is a book, especially for sci-fi horror fans, especially if you veer into a little bit more of the Lovecraftian isolation type stuff. But really, really solid. A great horror book on shelves. And this issue, best one yet, blew me away. And at number one, Ice Cream Man number 19, written by W. Maxwell Prince, with artwork by Martin Marazzo, Chris O'Halloran on the coloring. This is from Image Comics. Y'all know we love Ice Cream Man here. This issue is no exception. It's one of the best issues of the series yet. Um, just like Prince and O'Halloran and Marazzo typically do, they tell a great one-shot story that's a bit unsettling, incredibly unnerving, very poignant and nuanced, and also extremely innovative. The way that they tell the story is absolutely fantastic. It's a series of steps, as if you're reading a manual. So there are panels with dialogue, but there's also steps that you're taking, as if you're reading how to build something, how to do something. In this case, it's how to be a ghost how to be invisible to the world, how to go through life, never really ultimately getting to something. And just like every issue of Ice Cream Man, this is filled with a sickly sweet bitterness, despair, but a tinge of hopefulness that kind of just skims on the surface just a little bit and sometimes goes down a little bit and then it comes back. I, it's hard to describe this book, but it's so effective, so masterful. I don't know if at this point, if there's a better comic book on shelves right now, definitely not a better ongoing. I think Ice Cream Man is by far one of the most perfect comic books on shelves. The amount of times it pops up in my top five, the amount of times it's popped up in my top 10 of the, of the year, pretty much every year in its existence. Ice Cream Man is something else. It's next level to the, to the absolute definition of what that means. Nobody else is making comic books like this. Ice Cream Man is something completely different, and I am loving it. It's innovative, it's challenging, it's unsettling, it's effective, it's emotionally resonant, it's got something to say, and it's also just great, fun, weird stories all at the same time. So whatever you're looking for, you can find it in Ice Cream Man. It's my number one. So that's what I thought about what I read this week. Those are my top 10 picks that I would spotlight for you. What are your top five or top 10 or top three or whatever? What are your favorite comic books that came out this week? Let us know in the comments down below. Thank you so much for joining us here and watching the video, the return of my weekly top 10 comic book video. Very excited to do it. Lots more in store here at Pop Culture Philosophers. So thank you guys so much. Please do like, share, and subscribe and join us over at popculturephilosophers.com for podcasts and a whole lot more. Once again, thanks for rocking with us. Keep on reading.